So what we want to do today uh, is basically go over the uh, logistics for the group project that is coming up and also answer a question that had come up earlier related to something that was referred to in the group project and what the requirements were it's called the super tree. But let's just talk logistics. So I made some changes in the syllabus to accommodate where we are in the semester. So today <clears throat> is Monday, November 16th. And one week from today, on Monday, November 23rd, uh, you need to deliver the first part of your group project, which will be a PowerPoint presentation that is worth 7.5% of your semester grade. So for all sections, they will have to turn in, including yours, you have to turn in your PowerPoint by 10 a.m. on that day. And then that afternoon, one or more of your group members, it's up to you, but not the whole group has to do this, but will have to deliver that PowerPoint presentation in 10 minutes. <clears throat> and I'll use a countdown timer. So when 10 minutes is up, you're done. And then you'll be graded, and you'll be given a grade at the end of class, along with some feedback on any challenges that you may have had in the presentation. Now, during the 10-minute presentation, you have to cover all four sections. All right, so there's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, so you have to be extremely efficient at whoever presents, which is why it's probably likely you don't want to have six or seven people presenting because you'll just never get through. All right, so you'll just have you know, probably one, maybe two people present. It would be ideal. It's up to your group, though, but basically you'll make that presentation. Again, you have to cover EIC. You got to cover the historical financial analysis. You got to cover the multiples. You cover the valuation. Now, for the PowerPoint, <clears throat> you're not going to be turning in any additional files besides the PowerPoint, and you're not allowed to go outside the PowerPoint to show me any data. All right. So it's very important that your grade is going to be based on supporting data, so that all that supporting data needs to be embedded into the PowerPoint file. So, for example, you're not going to turn in your valuation. But in the valuation section of the PowerPoint, you might want to have some of the Excel data embedded or screenshots of it. Again, you're not going to turn in all of your Bloomberg exhibits. But in the EIC section, you'll probably want to have a screenshot of the RV. You'll probably want to have a screenshot of the beta when you're talking through the industry analysis. <clears throat> so that's next Monday. So. After class, as I said, I'll give you a grade. It'll be seven and a half points. You'll get a group grade for it, up to seven and a half points, <clears throat> and feedback on any challenges. The following Monday, <clears throat> Monday, November 30th, the Monday after Thanksgiving, your paper is due. Okay? So the paper is 15% of your semester grade as a group project. Right? And so that one, <clears throat> it's very important that hopefully, if there's any problems with your PowerPoint, you should be able to fix them in the week before you turn in the paper. Or if you do really well in the PowerPoint, then you should probably follow that recipe and then use that to turn in the paper because, again, you're talking about the same information. So the paper, <clears throat> when you turn that in by that Monday, November 30th at 10 a.m., is going to be multiple documents. You'll turn in three Excel files, your as-is, your bowl, and your bare Excel file. You'll also turn in a Word document, which is going to be approximately... 10 to 12 pages in length of write-up, approximately three pages a section, plus all the exhibits will be embedded in the Word document. So your actual Word file will probably be 20 to 25 pages long because you'll put in all your Bloomberg screenshots or whatever into the paper as well. And the paper is being graded independently of the PowerPoint. Okay, So that's what's going to be due on Monday, November 30th. So <clears throat> obviously that's the Monday after Thanksgiving. So on Wednesday, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I'm giving you time in class, in class, to work on your group project, right? So hopefully after Monday, you get your feedback, and I'd probably start working on the paper now, make any adjustments to the paper, turn it in, have it ready to go by that following Monday, right? And then sometime after November 30th, you'll make a second PowerPoint presentation either depending on the section to myself or possibly an external speaker depending on how the schedules and stars align and basically that'll be the final PowerPoint grade and again based on feedback on the first PowerPoint 
and or on the paper, you can further adjust that final PowerPoint. So hopefully everybody at that point will get full credit for that final 7.5% of your semester grade. Okay, So that's really what's entailed between now and the end of the semester with the group project. Any questions about the group project, what's required, or when it's due? Because I know the TA said that several of you had had questions about what's due when, so hopefully that kind of clears everything up. Okay, And I edited Elms <coughs> accordingly to, to represent the schedule that I just described. All right. <coughs> So the other part of the group project is some people were asking the TAs because here where it goes through the group project valuation requirements, there's a reference to something called the super tree. And so today in class, I want to talk about the super tree and how that fits into the group project, right? particularly the valuation stage. So that leads to homework 10. All right, so homework 10, which will be due this Wednesday, November 18th. All right, I made an adjustment on Elms. It's now worth two points, not one point, and it's due at 10 a.m. for all sections. Will be the super tree assignment because that's the last piece of the puzzle for your group project, and <clears throat> we're going to practice on the super tree. Okay, so the good news for you is homework 10 is the final graded homework assignment of the semester. Okay, So once we finish with homework 10 on Wednesday, then there's no more homework other than the group project. And the group projects obviously will be due fast and furious. It's a lot of work, but basically we'll finish all the homework as of this Wednesday. Final thing I want to mention about the group projects is the peer reviews. Right. So again, on the group project, you will get a group grade. All right, so whatever grade you get next Monday, so in class, you are going to present. All right, one team after another will cover all teams during Monday. That's why you can't have more than 10 minutes, because right, I'm going to go, literally go from one team to the next. And <clears throat> whoever presents, that grade is the grade that everybody gets within your group. All right, same thing with the paper. When you turn in the paper, the whole group gets that grade for the paper and the second PowerPoint presentation. With the following caveat, there is going to be a peer review based on level of effort. It's an optional peer review, but it will be available sometime next week. And the peer review will not only apply to the group valuation project, it will also apply to stock track. And so the way the peer review will work is that if everybody on your team did a fair amount of work and an equal amount of work, then you don't need to put the peer review and everybody gets the group grade. However, if you feel that one or more of your teammates did not participate at all or fully participate in either stock track throughout the semester or in the group project, then you can fill out a peer review giving them a percentage level of effort from zero to 100. Okay? If one of your group members gives you a negative peer review, it will not affect your grade. However, if two or more of your group members give you a negative peer review, I will lower your grade. Okay, So very, very important. You know, We're still a week out from when the PowerPoints are due. Now again, if one or two people are presenting it, that doesn't mean that one or two people should do the whole project and you get credit. Right? That's how you end up with a zero on the peer review and it'll be really bad for your grade. So again, over the next week, you should all as a team be equally participating in creating the papers creating the PowerPoints, attending group meetings. You should have been doing that with StockTrack all along, and that's what the peer review is going to measure. So again, there will be an optional graded peer review, which hopefully will not be necessary, but if it is, uh, and again, if more than one of your group members say you didn't participate, it's going to be very detrimental to your group grade. So I'm just giving everybody advance notice, <clears throat> so hopefully that is not an issue. So again, questions about the peer review. Questions about the project again? Hopefully pretty clear what's required. All right, so let's talk about the super tree. <clears throat> so the key to the super tree is that in section two, we're doing historical analysis on our company, whatever company we have been assigned. 
we're doing a historical ROIC tree, we're doing a historical CFI. But realistically, just like when we did the multiples, we don't, don't just want to look at our company, we want to benchmark our company against its peers to see how it's doing historically. And that's where the super tree comes in. So I put into Elms under the file section the following two files today. One is called supertree.xlsx, and the other one's called supertree-wag, which is walgreens.xlsx. Okay. So <clears throat> the idea is this. Again, I'll go back to the supertree file. And I'll start out with cash flow. So the idea is that in the, and, and by the way, the, the year is wrong. It should be the last five years. This should say 2014. But basically, if I look at a company or an industry and I go back to any one of our valuation models, right? So let me take, for example, with homework nine, the Merck as is valuation model. And when I open up the Merck model and I go to the CFI, here is Merck's CFI. Okay. Except what I really want to do is I want to see how does Merck CFI compare to some of its peers. Okay. So basically, this would be Merck. You know, this would be Johnson and Johnson. This would be Lilly. This would be I spell it right. Lilly, this would be Pfizer, etc. <clears throat> and what I would do is I'll take the gross cash flow for off the CFI. For Merck, and then I do the same thing for Johnson and Johnson, do the same thing for Lilly, do the same thing for Pfizer, so I would get an industry gross cash flow. Right? The same thing with free cash flow, reinvestment rate, and dividends and share buybacks. Okay? So, as an example, this is the super tree for pharma. Okay? So basically, this is the gross cash flow for Merck, J and J, Lilly, Pfizer, AbbVie, Bristol Myers, and this is the total gross cash flow for the industry. So, for example, I can quickly see that over a five-year period of time, they generated three hundred and eleven billion dollars worth of gross cash flow as an industry over the last five years. Free cash flow, they generated two hundred and fifty-four billion dollars of free cash flow. The average reinvestment rate. It's 25.6%, and this industry paid out what I consider to be a staggering amount of dividends and share repurchase of $226 billion over the last five years, mostly led by Pfizer. Right. So here's the point. Homework 10 is you must complete this super tree by Wednesday. So we will go over the super tree in class. So homework 10 is you have to create this super tree by 10 a.m. Wednesday morning, November 18th for all sections, right? So on Wednesday in class, we will go over the super tree. We will go over the Merck valuation for pharma, and we will go over the Merck multiple analysis for pharma. Okay, so we'll do the deep dive into the industry on Wednesday. So the missing piece after you did the first two parts of the homework, which today would have been the Merck valuation and the multiples, is now to add in the industry super tree. So the super tree is to look at the cash flow, <clears throat> and then the super tree is to look at the industry ROIC tree. So again, in our model, so if I go back to the Merck valuation that you just turned in, our model creates for you under the ROIC drivers, the <coughs> ROIC tree automatically <coughs> for a company, in this case Merck. And what I need to do is to create it for all six companies. So Merck, J&J, Lilly, AbbVie, Bristol Myers, and then put all the trees into the super tree. Now, <coughs> what that practically means is a lot of copying and pasting. Okay, So what you're going to have to do and this is actually relatively easy, right? Is <clears throat> you can take any one of the valuation models. So in this case, I'll take the Merck model that we just did the homework assignment on. Go to the model data tab, then go to Bloomberg. Let's say we're going to do Johnson and Johnson, 
type in JNJ, U.S. Equity, go to FA, <coughs> go to your custom model tab that you have created, and output to Excel the data. Okay. Once you have done that, then with the J&J &J data, so here is the J&J &J data that I had exported in a previous class. Select it just like you were going to update the model. Copy it. Go into the model. Pay special values. Just like we were going to do evaluation of J&J. &J. Except, at this point, you're done. All right? You don't have to do the rest of the input for J&J. &J. You don't have to do the EEO. You don't have to do the shares outstanding. You don't have to do the WAC because we're not doing evaluation. All right? So then what the Excel spreadsheet automatically does is if you go over here to the CFI, then this is the historical CFI for J&J. &J. If you go to the ROIC tree, the ROIC drivers tab, this is the ROIC drivers for J&J. So what I would have to do is literally manually copy and paste, copy, go to my super tree, J and J, paste special values, the data, row by row. Tedious process, probably take you about 30 minutes, but that's the process you need to do for Wednesday. All right? Now, to save you a little bit of time, and I know some of you have had trouble with exporting data on some of the Bloomberg terminals. What I did is there's a folder in Elms files called Merck, MRK. In this folder is the data export for each one of the six companies. Okay, so I saved you a little time, I export the data. However, very important, if you remember when you export data, we have to replace the dash dashes with zeros, otherwise Excel chokes. I did not do the replacing of the dash dashes with zeros. So when you open up the file, Find replace, dash dash with zero, replace all, then copy paste. Otherwise, you'll get some errors in your model. Right? And then the final thing is when you're doing the dividends and the share repurchase, part of the cash flow, which is down here, dividends and buybacks, then what you need to do <clears throat> is basically come in here to your model. I'll do uh, the Merck model again back to CFI and that's what I'm saying you see how there's values in here so if you have that error go back to this is now J&J &J, but go back to edit <coughs> find replace dash dash with zero replace all and that in your CFI will fix that issue more importantly what you'll need to do is for dividends and buybacks, you want to add preferred dividends if they have any. By the way, Pfizer is the only company that has preferred dividends. To the common dividends, to the share repurchase. You don't want to do share issues. We're not doing net. We're just doing pure share buybacks and dividend common and preferred payments. Okay, That's what we're adding and aggregating to the dividends and buybacks. Okay, So that's what you're going to need to do to create the super tree on sort of a mechanical basis. Again, I'll pause. Questions? Questions about creating the super tree for the what now is the homework 10 assignment for those companies? Because basically what's on the screen here is what you have to create. I already created it. So <clears throat> back to this. So the other thing you're going to have to do is some analysis. So I did put up a second super tree earlier today, and it's called in the files folder. SuperTree-WAG, which stands for Walgreens. Right? So let me open up that file and talk to you about the analysis. So I'll start out with cash flow. <clears throat> so Walgreens is a drugstore, and basically they have three major drug publicly traded drugstores in the U.S. You have Walgreens, which I have listed here as WAG. You have CVS, and RAD is Rite Aid. Okay? And basically, those are the only three drugstores. Matter of fact, if you go to like New York, you'll see like Dwayne Reed. They're actually owned by Walgreens. They bought them a couple years ago. And if you've been paying attention, two weeks ago, 
Walgreens purchased Rite Aid. So now there's actually going to be two unless the De Department of Justice intervenes and says for antitrust reasons we're not going to let that happen. But basically, as of last year, 2014, by the way, there's an error here. This should say 2014 for the year, last five years. <clears throat> basically, that is the uh, super tree for those three companies. So here's the idea. Got my data, and what do I know about this industry? Well, first of all, this industry generated about $49 billion worth of gross cash flow. They turned that into $26 billion worth of free cash flow, and their reinvestment rate was about 36%. Right? They also paid out about $29 billion worth of dividends and buybacks, which basically was a little bit more than 100% of their free cash flow. So this industry pretty much distributed all of its cash flow back to investors. But here's what's interesting. Rite Aid didn't really distribute anything. So almost all that distribution came from Walgreens and CVS, and the majority of the distribution came from CVS. So <clears throat> what's interesting is Walgreens and CVS have substantially higher gross cash flow than Rite Aid. Right? Even in 2014, when Rite Aid has been improving, and you can see that they weren't doing that well in 2010, and by 2014 had turned $573 million into a billion one, <clears throat> basically, from a gross cash flow standpoint, Walgreens and CVS are much bigger firms and generating a lot more cash flow. So even though these three firms have similar reinvestment rates generally over time, with the exception of 2010, 2011, you can kind of get a prelude as to why Rite Aid got purchased. Because basically, they don't really have a lot of cash flow, and they're not really reinvesting that much of the smaller cash flow compared to the bigger firms. And if you think about what's been happening with a lot of these drugstores, they've either opened a bunch of brand new locations, and given the smaller size of Rite Aid, they can't afford to open up the locations of the CVSs and the Walgreens, or they've been sprucing up their stores. And I don't know if anybody's been to a Rite Aid recently, but the stores aren't very nice. And they're kind of falling apart, and they haven't really had a lot of investment in them. CVS and Walgreens have much nicer stores. And that's the point. When you're investing 30% of billions of dollars, you have the cash flow to improve your stores. When you're investing 30% of not much money, you don't really have the cash flow to improve your stores. And that's been the story of Walgreens, that they've really struggled. They haven't really generated a lot of cash. They haven't made a lot of investments in their stores. And by the way, that's probably why they were bought, right? Because Walgreens is now buying them and is going to probably have to put some investment in them in order to spruce up their stores. But they really couldn't keep up with their much larger competitors. So that's kind of the story of the industry we see with the cash flow. And that's part of the reason why we do the super trip. So if we were valuing CVS or Walgreens, we'd want to know that information going in to our valuation. It gives us some additional industry context. Same thing with the ROIC trip. So with the ROIC tree, again, industry ROIC went from about 8%, 7.6 to 13.5. But when I look a little bit more closely, what I can see is almost all of that improvement came from Rite Aid, which went from 0.8% to almost 18%. Okay? Whereas Walgreens went from 12.6 to 11.6, and CVS went from 9.6 to 11.2. So pretty much the industry improvement, because this is not a weighted average, this is a straight average, but basically is coming from Rite Aid's improvement. Now, <clears throat> if I look at what hurt Walgreens, it's actually the tax rate. So here's an example where their tax rate went from 38% to 43%. And again, Walgreens now has a different ticker symbol this year. It used to be WAG. Now it's, I think, WBS, because they're now the Walgreens Boots Alliance. And what Walgreens did is they merged with Boots, a big UK drugstore, which was based in Switzerland, which pays a whole lot lower taxes. And that was one of the primary reasons for the merger, is Walgreens is paying a huge amount in taxes, and it's really hurting their performance. So by buying boots, I think one of the goals, longer term, is to start to lower their effective tax rate and uh, to, to branch out of the U.S. But back to this. So if you look at the pre-tax, Walgreens has actually gotten pretty stable pre-tax ROIC. CVS has improved, and Rite Aid has improved dramatically. Now, when I look at what's behind the improvement at Rite Aid, for them, it's all operating margin. They went from basically zero to almost 3%. However, they're still well below the industry average in terms of profitability. That the class of the industry, when it comes to operating margins, is really CVS. 
that they're making substantially higher margins consistently than Walgreens or Rite Aid. And if you look at productivity, you can see that the industry productivity has been improving, and it's been improving across the board. Rite Aid's improving, CVS is improving, Walgreens is improving. But when we go to the second level tree, we see an interesting story <clears throat> that CVS has the most intangible to sales. 26 cents down to almost 21 cents. Walgreens is three cents. Rite Aid really hasn't been doing acquisition. So CVS has been the most acquisitive of all of the firms. And a lot of that is when they bought a prescription benefit management company, I think it was Express Scripts or somebody, uh, or one of them, a couple of years ago. And that's where all that goodwill really came from. But that also gave them an economy of scale and gave them better profit margins. They're all improving, and you can see the industry, little PP&E to sales. So 16.6 .6 to 16, 8 to 6.8, 8 8.9 to 7.7. 7. They're improving their working capital, and so across the board they're getting improvement. What's interesting is in the margins. The gross margins at Walgreens have been pretty steady. CVS, the gross margins have actually come down. And Rite Aid, the gross margins have gone up. So what's benefited CVS is the fact that they've gotten their cost of running the business, their SG&As down, while Walgreens has gotten the cost of running their business <coughs> slightly up despite their gross margins. So the reason why Walgreens operating margins have stayed in place, pretty consistent gross margin, CVS, a little decline in gross margin and more spending on the SGNA. And Rite Aid has basically seen improvements dramatically in gross margin and reductions of SGNA, but they're still squeezed relative to their peers in having below average profit. So, long story short, this is what I mean by getting sort of an industry view of what's happening, and this is why we're doing the super treat. Right? So, your assignment, homework 10, is to do this for pharma to do it for the same six pharma companies you did the multiples on, it's written in the assignment, and to create the tree, right? And then write up the tree. So you're gonna turn in two files. One is an Excel file where you create the tree, and two is a write-up. Now this one doesn't have to be pages and pages long. I just want you to gonna practice telling me what's going on with the industry cash flow, tell me what's going on with the industry ROIC, and we'll discuss it in class. However, next week when you're doing your PowerPoint, all right, if you think about the second section where you're doing the historical analysis on CFI and ROIC, that section should really be in context of the super tree rather than just your individual company because it's a lot more meaningful when you can put your company against the peers to talk about what's been happening historically because that will help you when you do your evaluations. So again, this is what the references to the super tree meant. Again, questions about any of this? All right, so what I'm going to do, uh, because, like I said, Wednesday's a short turnaround, is I'm giving you the rest of the class to basically work to create this super tree, right? And hopefully, before you leave, you can have it done. Now, there's not enough terminals to do this, so that's why I said I put the data, the Excel files, onto Elms. So you can quickly use that data to create the files, right? But you'll pretty much need to create five more, if you did Merck, because Merck's already done, create five more Excel spreadsheets. Again, you don't have to do valuations. Be very clear. If you just take the Merck file or Apple or one of the other ones we worked on and you just take the model data tab and update it, you can then copy and paste and create the tree. All right, it's a tedious process. It's a manual process. As I said, somebody in the first class actually was going to try and do this in Bloomberg to automate it. And you can do that, but it'll take you a lot longer than 20 minutes. And this is the only other time you're going to do this is for your group project this semester. So if we were doing it again and again and again, I could show you how to do it in Bloomberg, but it'd take a lot more than 20 minutes to automate the export of all this data. So for our purposes, we're just going to export the data in our model, copy and paste it into the super tree file, and that's the tree that we'll use. So again, Wednesday, we're doing it on the six pharmas. Next week, next Monday, you should do the same analysis for section two on your company and its peers. And most importantly, do the bigger peers. So if you have like 15 peers in your RV list, like same thing, pick the top six, you know, just like you're doing the multiples, because you don't want to do every single company in the industry, especially the smaller ones. You kind of want to do the biggest one because you're trying to get an industry representation. And that's the practice of what we want to do. So while you're working on that, if anybody has questions about your group project, I am up here in the front. 
you're welcome to talk to me about your group projects, and I'm willing to help with that. But otherwise, really, for the rest of today, giving you time to work on the super tree, you can work together on creating the Excel file, right? But very clearly, you have to write up the analysis yourself. Okay, so that part's individual, right? Because again, I know there's not enough computers to go around in this room, right? So questions, let me know. Otherwise, be prepared on Wednesday to, like I said, we'll talk through a very deep dive of what's going on with Big Pharma. So the Merck valuation, the Merck multiples, and then the Merck super tree. That's what we'll do next. And I have recorded this, and I am posting this on just a second on Elms, if you have any questions about what we just talked about. All right, where's today, November 16th, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15.